Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. Good morning, everyone. To those I haven't met, my name's Daniel Choi. I'm one, of, uh, I'm one out of the two student interns here at New West CRC. Uh, currently, I'm a third year student at Regent College. And this semester, I've been focusing a lot more on young adult ministries with Zion. Um, together, we're doing a Bible study after church. And thus far, it's been a wonderful experience. And I'm happy that we've cemented a place for the young adults to worship and also share scripture together. Today, I get the opportunity to preach on Reformation Sundays of all days. When I told one of my housemates that I would preach this week, she jokingly told me that instead of preaching, I should just stamp my sermon transcript on the front door of our church. <laughs> Throughout our service, we've brought up five distinguished teachings that the Reformation articulated. Let's reflect on our fourth teaching, Sola Scriptura, by Scripture alone. So before we read our passage, please join me in confessing our doctrine on God's word. We know God by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe, since that universe is before our eyes like a beautiful book, in which all creatures are as letters to make us ponder the invisible things of God. Second, he makes himself known to us more openly by his holy and divine word, as much as we need in this life for his glory and for the salvation of us all, salvation of his own. We receive all these books and these only as holy and canonical for the regulating, founding, and establishing of our faith. Let us thank God for his holy word. We thank you, God, for your holy word. We thank you for the special care this shows you have for us and our salvation. Our reading today comes from Matthew 11, 25 to 30. We'll have the verses on screen, but you're also encouraged if you wanna open your Bibles uh, to, read to, to read alongside me. Hear these words from God. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you, are, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thus far our reading from God's word. To begin, I would like to ask all of you a question to ponder. When you hear the word God, what is the first image that comes to your mind? Is he like a father who eagerly lifts up his children and puts them on his shoulders? Maybe he's like a school teacher that's just super boring and you can't understand anything that he's saying. When I was growing up, I watched a lot of Charlie Brown and I always found it amusing how whenever you would hear the teachers, it would just be complete gibberish. Is God someone who is distant and far away with the only way for him to bend down and listen to our voice and give us attention as if we follow all of his commands and display faithfulness? Lastly, maybe some of us see God as a tyrannical ruler who demands perfection and is just a complete killjoy. 
He wants complete blind obedience and quickly lashes out his anger and frustration. He always has his eyes on you. And if you make the slightest wrong step, he would be so quick to tell you all of the things you immediately did wrong. Suppose you asked me several years ago, which depiction out of the four resonated with me the most? It would actually be the last one. To give you an idea of what kind of dynamic this looked like, I'll share a bit of a personal story with you, or at least the first half. I grew up deeply struggling with the concept that God is welcoming. It was just not something I could ever wrap my head around. Even though I grew up in the church my whole life, whenever I heard gospel, it would just jump immediately to legalism. I would try my best to get his approval, and anything less than that would put me down a downward spiral where I would feel guilty and shameful. And as a result, I would just try harder, which would just lead to the same pattern over and over again. I constantly felt burdened knowing, I constantly felt burdened by the weight of knowing that I couldn't get up to his standards. I know that this feeling of guilt and shame is something that may be familiar to some of you here today. Perhaps some of us have experienced similar thoughts, and perhaps when we see God, we don't see him as the loving father that scripture actually says he is. Today, we get to see how close and how welcoming God truly is. God reveals himself through Christ and offers himself to those who are childlike and weighed down by heavy burdens. So to give a brief overview and also to provide a trajectory of the path that we're headed, at the start, Jesus prays to the Father, thanking him for choosing to reveal himself to little children while hiding himself from the wise and learned. Jesus then proclaims the importance of his relationship with the Father. No one knows the Son except the Father and vice versa. Nobody can know the Father except whoever the Son chooses to reveal himself to. Finally, the last three verses are an invitation to know God and to be free of our burdens, replacing them with an easy yoke. So this sermon will have three major points. Childlike faith reveals Christ, Christ reveals the Father to us, and Christ invites the burdened to rest upon him. This story begins with Jesus praying to the Father, and specifically, he's, thanks, he's thanking him for hiding himself from some while choosing to reveal himself to others. Specifically, God hides his truth from those who are wise and learned and reveals it to the childlike. How do we hold these two things together? To start with the wise and learned, Jesus isn't speaking about people who have great education or have a high intellect, who are rational, who are thinking people. It's referring to people who are too stubborn to listen and acknowledge, and acknowledge any need for God people who were too prideful, overconfident. The wise and learned are those who exalt themselves. On the other hand, the childlike are the ones who receive Jesus's revelation. The childlike are humble enough to recognize their need for God. Children shouldn't rely on their own resources, although I'm sure when I was a kid, I was very different and often depend on their parents because they earnestly seek their adoration. Jesus shows that if we have the same childlike wonder, a desire to know God and his affection, he will reveal himself to us. Those who are dependent are going to, are going to be open and receptive to God's truth. When I think of an example of what it means to be childlike, I think of Lucy, uh, Lucy Penvency, that last name is hard to pronounce, one of the four main characters in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. Out of the four children, she is the youngest one. She is also the first to believe, 
And out of the four, she is the most faithful follower to Aslan. She isn't a skeptic or comes to her conclusions by logic. After she first enters Narnia, she continues to ardently believe and also remain truthful. Her faith is beyond reasoning, you could say. In one particular scene that's in both the book and also in the movie, her oldest brother, Peter, lectures her and accuses her of lying for claiming that nothing is behind the wardrobe. C.S. Lewis writes these words. For the next few days, Lucy was very miserable. She could have made it up with the others quite easily at any moment if she could have brought herself to say that this whole thing, Narnia, was just a made-up story for fun. But Lucy was a very trustful girl, and she knew that she was really in the rights, and she couldn't bring herself to lie. Lucy shows that she believes Narnia exists even though her siblings wouldn't believe her. In their minds, there wasn't any, there wasn't any chance a place like that could exist. They were too trustful in their own reasoning. What Lucy exemplifies, we must be childlike when we approach Christ. When we read scripture, we must approach him with a childlike curiosity and an eagerness to know him. Christ here and continually, he will show himself and offer us to embrace him with complete loyalty. And as we can see, our own reasoning and intelligence aren't going to be the basis for how well we know God. The next section shows us who knows God most deeply and also by extension, how we can receive him. Verse 27 states, all things have been committed to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son and those to whom the son chooses to reveal himself. This verse perfectly summarizes the intimate relationship the father and the son share. All things from the father have been given to the son, meaning both the father and the son have the same gospel plan to save and redeem their creation. The father is willing to give Christ the plans to bring salvation to his people. And as for the son, he reciprocates that faithfulness by obeying God and even praying to him. Now this is, admittedly, this is dense theology. It sounds like one of my region classes. So I'll try to parse out as best as possible what it means for God the Father and God the Son to know one another and also what that means for us. Jesus expands on his unique relationship with the Father by saying, no one knows the Son except the Father and no one knows the Father except the Son. When this passage uses knowledge, knowing one another, it isn't like two acquaintances who are familiar to the point where they can name what their likes and dislikes, what their friend groups are. It's not even like two friends who have known each other for a very long time, so they've had that longevity. Even if you have been married to someone for over 50 years, I assume you will still admit that there are things that you do not have knowledge of the other person. The level of intimacy that the father and son share is far greater than what we can ever experience on any relationship here. Christ the son and God the father share something that nobody else in this world has, perfect knowledge of each other. The depth and intimacy that these two have stretch beyond whatever relationship we can attain. In J.I. Packer's great book, Knowing God, Packer describes the limitations of human knowledge and how well we're able to know each other. Packer writes these words. One does not know a living thing until one knows its past history and how it's likely to react and behave under certain circumstances. In the case of human beings, knowing becomes much more complicated. People keep secrets. They don't show everybody all that's in their hearts. You may spend months or years doing something in the company of another person 
and still have to say that at the end of that time, I still don't really know them. While even the strongest human relationships carry certain limitations, the father and son's relationship is completely open and transparent. They don't keep secrets from each other. Their thoughts and knowledge is completely honest and vulnerable. The father and son's relationship is completely beyond how we can ever connect with a person here. So how do we get to receive and experience that relationship? That's great for the father and son, but what does, you know, what does that mean for us? If nobody knows the father except the son, do we ourselves have any hope of knowing God? Or are we stuck simply observing God? Can we actually get to, get to the heart of who he is? The rest of the verse tells us that we know God only through Christ. The rest of verse 27 states, God the Father is shown to whom the Son chooses to reveal. The way we know God all personally hinges upon Christ, on Christ alone. Jesus reveals how God is acting relationally. The intimate relationship with the Father and Son is revealed to us through Jesus. And when he comes down to earth, Jesus shows the heart of his Father. He ministers to broken communities and searches for the childlike. He commands and tells us to let go of our burdens and our sins. And he tells us that he's going to give us a new and easier yoke. When we know Jesus, we get to know God and learn to depend on him with a childlike faith. This is much greater than head knowledge or a lesson to shape our ethics and our morality. This is going beyond knowing about God, but this is knowing God personally. Knowing God changes the heart and becomes truly life-giving. Seeing Jesus' relationship with the Father changes, changes our head knowledge into real knowledge that the Father and Son share. When we see the Son's deep love for the Father and his complete trust in him, that is the confidence and the space that we can have in God as well. Thus far, this sermon has illustrated that God welcomes those who are childlike and dependent on him. We also see that we get to know our God through the Son. And finally, these last three verses will show us what Jesus offers and who he is inviting to know him personally. Final three verses, some of the most memorized passages in all of scripture. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Who can receive the childlike faith that Jesus began talking about? Who's Jesus willing to reveal himself to? Jesus says, all of us who are weary and burdened. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, come to me, all of you who are righteous, all of you who are educated and rich and important. When Jesus speaks of the heavy burdened, He's speaking about those who are weighed down by sin, those who are bogged down by guilt and shame, those who are sinful. Jesus invites all of us to come and give us rest. Jesus proclaims, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Yokes were wooden harnesses that joined two animals, typically oxen, to pull heavy objects. A yoke would metaphorically mean two things. As we mentioned, it's the sin that we carry that burdens and weighs on our shoulders. A yoke could also be a metaphor for the law. During this time, the law was originally meant to help Israel, to help God's people 
on how to live with God and also how to cooperate and worship together. Pharisees were, during Jesus' time, the ones who would instruct on what laws to follow. And instead of making the law life-giving like it was supposed to do, they actually turned it and twisted it into legalism. They would preach that we have to obey all of the commands to prove that we're faithful and to receive God's love. They also added extra laws on top of that out of their own tradition. The Pharisees would overwhelm their disciples with heavy burdens that they themselves would actually never be able to measure up to. So they were giving people impossible standards of how to live for God. Instead of learning from the Pharisees or any legalistic yoke that tells us that God's love is dependent on our actions, Jesus invites us to take his yoke, to learn from him. Jesus's yoke means that we let Christ be our teacher and we become his disciples. His offer means to stop relying on ourselves and instead rely upon him to return to the metaphor of the oxen carrying the yoke, when farmers would use oxen to pull something, one of, I guess the photo doesn't really illustrate it that well, but typically one of the oxen was significantly smaller than the other one. And the reason for this is so that the older, much stronger oxen would be able to do more of the heavy lifting. And also it was to teach the younger oxen what they're supposed to be doing. When Christ gives us his yoke, the one that is less burdening, it's like he is the bigger oxen, the one that carries the weight of our sins, the one who teaches and guides us as the younger oxen. Our role is to trust and lessen and to give God what he calls us to do, to, old, to follow the older and wiser oxen. Faith isn't about doing more. Our relationship with God isn't centered on morality or doing the right thing and being a righteous person. It's about depending on Jesus. It's acknowledging our sins and giving them to God, knowing that he is trustworthy, he's able to heal us and remove every burden that could ever weigh on our sins. Instead of trying to overcome sin by our own works, we receive grace from God alone. To tie this with the start of our passage, Jesus invites us to bring ourselves to God. Jesus calls us to be childlike and to let go of the guilt and the shame that sin brings. Jesus is calling all of you to come and depend on him and to receive his loving care. When we act childlike, and give him our heavy burdens, he, promise, he promises to steward us well and hold us in the palm of his hand. Christ is gentle and humble at heart. He replaces our heavy yoke with one that's much lighter, one that's harnessed with grace. At the beginning of this sermon, I shared a bit personally how in my own life, if I heard this message several years ago, it would honestly just go through my head. I deeply struggled with the need of being of feeling like I needed to be perfect in order for God to be happy with me. And I would like to close our time by sharing how I was able to learn to unlearn from that. How God was able to show me what childlike faith is supposed to look like. I shared that I would often be stuck in a cycle of working toward God and seeking to be perfect to win his approval. I remember one practice in particular that should have brought me joy, but instead made me feel constantly disappointed, was praying before bed. When we struggle with the legalistic mindsets, it often feels very paranoid. I remember constantly asking, Am I doing enough? Am I doing the right thing? Is God content and happy with me? Every time I prayed before I went to bed, whenever I lost focus or felt like I was dozing off, 
I actually felt like I was disappointing and angering God. And saying this out loud is honestly a little bit embarrassing, but that is truly how I felt. I would wake up feeling like the first thing I needed to do was confess and apologize to God for not being as focused as I could have been. When I told my campus minister, Tim Wood, in undergrad, he told me, some, he gave me encouragement that just felt like God was speaking through him. Pastor Tim and his wife recently had a baby, and he told me one of the best parts of being a dad is when he holds his kid in his arms and she's just sleeping, knowing she's at complete peace and she's fully dependent on him. Brothers and sisters, that's how God looks at us. That childlike love and rest in the Father is exactly what God is willing to offer us. Christ welcomes us to be like little children. We can be free of any burdens, have our fears melted away, our sin and our shame completely removed. We can be dependent on God. He gives that offer to us. God invites us to receive him as a loving father. He truly delights in you. There isn't a moment where his eyes are not on you. His attention is distracted from you. Where his love and care for you falters, even on your worst days, that doesn't change. God says, all of you who are weary and burdened, come to me. Those who are overwhelmed and hurting feel broken by sin. His arms are open wide and he's ready to receive us. So let's fully depend on him, knowing that he's completely reliable as our author and perfecter of our faith. As we reflect on our one source of salvation, I encourage you to read with me question and answer one of the Heidelberg Catechism and to give God the praise that he deserves. I invite you all to stand with me. People of God, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair on my head without the will of my Father. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation, because I belong to him. Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen.